Hello. Hello, Tim McCain. It's Lee Garlington here. Hey, Lee. How are you doing today? Um, today is a good day. How about you? I'm doing awesome. Hey, um, you're already recording. Just real quick, we're already in the middle of this podcast. Uh, you just oh, want to jump wow. right into it? Okay, yeah. Lee, I want to thank you so much for calling into the podcast. This is this is awesome. Honestly, um, when we got the call that we were going to get a chance to talk with you, I uh, looked at a lot of your work, and I say this with the utmost respect. I love it, but I'm like, oh, I know her. You are been, you have been a working character actress and showed up in a lot. Uh, and I mean a lot of TV and sitcoms and movies I watched. That's just a long-winded way to say thank you for calling. I really, really, truthfully respect your career. Well, right back at you, and I think your podcast is wonderful. Oh, wow. You listen to podcasts? I am a podcast queen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, walk, I walk about 40 miles a week, so I listen to podcasts all the time. Oh, well... Well, thank you. All right. It's good to know that, um, you know, we're doing a good thing. Um, the reason you're giving us a call is because you're being nominated. We were talking about the Emmys earlier, clearly, and you're being nominated for Outstanding Actress in a Short Form Comedy or Drama. That is a true fact. And I saw the scenes that you were in and in Broken. You played Darlene. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, can you give us a little breakdown of the character? Darlene is, the, the whole web series is about um, mental illness and schizophrenia and what happens if it's not properly treated, either because not the person's not properly medicated or what have you. And Darlene is a therapist working with a young man who is, how, how, how would you describe him? He's, he's, he's very locked into his beliefs and and everything negative that he did. I don't want to give it away if anybody wants to watch it. Okay. So it's, it's the journey of trying to work with somebody who's really stuck and doesn't get that they, doesn't understand the nature of what their dis-ease is. Okay, okay. And, and, I mean, I'm trying to say this without giving away spoilers or anything, but by watching it, I see your role, and what you're trying to do is to show his, for lack of a better term, um, you're trying to show him the real world based, I mean, based on what it is versus what he believes it is. Yes, and I think also the fact that you can't ever really get better until you can forgive yourself and truly let go of the things you did that were unfortunate, but you were powerless over them because you were caught in a disease. I, I, you know, what's funny, schizophrenia, I actually think serial killers are addicts, just like alcoholics or food addicts or gambling addicts. It's like you, you get hooked into this behavior and it, it's this adrenaline flow and you can't stop it. Schizophrenia is different, but it's, you cannot, what is it we say, you know, you're, you're as sick as your secrets and you can't start to get better until you can acknowledge out loud you know, this is what I did, I'm so sorry, and I don't want to do it anymore. And that makes sense. I'm trying to word it without getting... I think everyone should watch Broken, mainly because when you see it, you you play such an important role, um, and it is not an easy topic to bring up, clearly. Um, no, and I have, I have schizophrenia in my family, um... Uh, uh, part of my extended family, a young woman who got it at the age of six. And childhood schizophrenia is particularly challenging because the body keeps changing so rapidly and the medication that worked last week or last month no longer works. And most people get it between the ages of 20 and 30. And it's a, uh, once you get it, it's basically you don't grow much psychologically or mentally past whatever age you got it. So it's a it's a very um, debilitating and kind of a life sentence. It's, you can never not medicate it. There's that one. What's that movie Jamie Foxx did that was so wonderful where he plays a musician? 
Um, oh, I know what you're talking about, too. Yeah. That, um, and he has schizophrenia. And again, it's a disease that can really be managed with the proper medication and you know, psychological help. And it really takes over if you don't have those two elements. And, I mean, it's weird. Okay, here's what I want. All the people under the sound of my voice, please watch Broken because I really want to go in deep in your character without. But if I do, I'm, I'm going to give out. I'm going to give away some stuff. <laughs> but let, let's shift gears. Trust me, you can you can check it out. Just take my word on it. You play a great role. And if you don't mind, I, I would like to kind of rewind the clock because you didn't just start doing great roles in Broken. I mean, you've been doing this for almost thirty years. Um, I've been doing this, yeah, but exactly how long I think I've been doing it, actually making my living. I haven't had to say, would you like to raise a Caesar salad with that since uh, 1984? That's good. So, that, four that, years. That's 34 years. 34 yeah. Years. Damn, I'm old. You're not old. You're, you're, you're seasoned. You're experienced. I'm seasoned. I love that. I'm seasoned. That's my new word. You're seasoned. <laughs> um, Like, one cool thing about this is that you you used to be a sound engineer for NPR. I did. And you woke up and chased your dream, and it landed you in L.A. I, I got to know, what was the landscape like then? I mean, we live in a world with social media, with phone, cell phones, where you could just do a YouTube video and you're the new hot thing, but you hit the ground running where those avenues wasn't available. Um, yeah, and I got here in 1980 and I was uh, 26. I wasn't young and beautiful. I was, uh, I had no experience, no credits, no friends, no um, pictures, resumes, and I had to sort of like, you know, build the, the, the wheel. I had to invent the wheel. And it was, back then it was basically equity waiver. Um, or 99 seat plan play, and I, you know, I do the orientation for the new members to SAG after. I've been doing it for about 25 years, and I always say you guys have more platforms right now to put yourself out there than there is good content. When I was starting out, you either did stand up comedy, you tried to write your own thing, or you got cast in plays. So I sort of became one of the queens of Equity Waiver, and I did a ton of plays and. I was very lucky. Basically, my first play, I had a casting director, the fabulous Jackie Birch, stay after and say, I really like you, who represents you. And I went, bleh, 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 nobody. And she set me up with five agents who I don't think gave a damn about meeting this little unknown actress. But this is, Hollywood is a town of, it's not who you know, it's who you know that likes you. <laughs> and a casting like director asks you to do you a favor, you absolutely do that favor because then you want that casting director to call in your clients. So one of those agents actually took me and Jackie brought me in for my first role in a movie, uh, my first role in anything, and she, I think she actually negotiated my contract for me. It was uh, playing Myrna the Mean Waitress in Psycho 2. It was four days of work. I made $1,600, which was double my annual salary at that point. And it was like, whoa, I'm on my way. And that was the beginning of my career. You know, I, I, can, I did another play by the same playwright that ran for 22 months. And because I was on stage four nights a week, and there was an uh, up-and-coming TV star in our show, uh, the fabulous Jean Smart, who became one of my closest friends. Mm -hmm. And Jean would go do one of her 19,000, you know, pilots that she did during that time. And I would go on as her most Friday nights. And really, that's how my career began, because all the, you know, one of the things about Hollywood is if something is cool or good, even if it's just a little play, Word of, and it gets legs, i.e. it has a star in it or it runs for any length of time, and we were up for almost two years, the good casting directors will, in fact, come see it, and that's how they find talent. Everybody wants to think they've discovered someone. Well, when you talk about discovery, um, I may be showing myself a little bit, but where I discovered you is, honestly, as Rose's daughter in Golden Girls. Because, funny. and I just quote, and I'm using air quotes here, you can't see it, discovered you because I'm like, at first I was confused because I was, I didn't think she had kids. I didn't, th just based on storyline, I don't think she's smart <laughs> enough to have kids. Well, I think I was like in the last season I came in. Mm-hmm. And you were Rose's, yeah. 
and I wanted to learn more about your character because she's she's like the dummy of the group. And how does the dummy of the group have kids that that turned out pretty okay? Um, from all you know, just based on the character. And then from there, I guess I got a chance to see you. Then obviously you were in Cobra, you were in the Killing. But one of my favorite things of seeing you in, especially because I had to watch this movie probably about once a week, you were in Field of Dreams. I was. Um, growing up playing baseball. You you always watch no pun intended the hits you were in field uh, field of dreams Bull Durham you always had to watch a baseball movie just right. kind of like just to get you so like every couple of weeks or so I would see you if memory serves me right you were a Beulah correct well that was I didn't my character didn't actually have a name but Amy Madigan refers to me as Beulah the Nazi cow so that's how they put my Billy mm -hmm. which I thought was hysterical. Yes, and Phil Alden Robinson directed that movie, and for whatever reason, God bless him, he's most one of the kindest, most talented men in Hollywood. He decided I was his good luck charm, so he put me in all of his move, movies. So I was in Field of Dreams, In the Mood, Some of All Fears, Sneakers, uh, The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, and it was just such an honor. I got to meet my boyfriend, Morgan Freeman. I call him my boyfriend, my <laughs> husband doesn't mind. Um, so I, I had the honor of working with so many wonderful people because of Phil. So he's been one of the great joys of my career. And and that I mean that kind of um, shot you in the world of TV. Um, fun fact: uh, a lot of people don't know I am a diehard Seinfeld fan. Mm. So you were essentially Elaine before Elaine. You were the. Can you tell us a little bit about? It? I, is it a Good thing. You know how I like to think of it, Sam? I had a wonderful guest star on a show that went on to be a hit series, and that's what I'd like to say about that. Okay, because, like I said, I don't, I don't know the feelings. Like, in research of this, and I've seen a few Seinfeld documentaries, and just, just being a fan, um, there's two different, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, but there's two different distinct ways it's viewed. One is like, Oh, poor her, which is not the case. And uh, the other one is, I don't know what happened. So, and out of all those documentaries and all of the stuff, no one ever asked you straight up. No, they did. It's in a book um, somewhere. I've never, you know, I've never seen any of the documentaries. I've never read any of the material. It's, uh, it's just the thing that happened. And I like to think of it as a fabulous guest star and a wonderful bit series. All right. Now that we got it from straight from the source, Yep. we will move on. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, one thing I, I enjoyed you in, and this is a deep cut, you got to be in over 200, 300 movies or so, 200 TV shows. Now, one thing that I loved that you were in is Psych. You were Gus's love interest. You were in prison in Psych, but you being in prison and for I think about that time it was season two, season three. He he just swore up and down he had a girlfriend, and now when they showed who you were in Psych, it was just like oh okay that makes sense. The fact well that I don't think I was really his girlfriend. I think you know that was one of those ones my friend Gene Smart had the role and she had to have a best friend and she actually said to the casting directors, can you bring my friend Lee up here? So that's why I got that role. And I I think what it was is he just became obsessed with me because I wasn't interested in him. And here he's this young buck and here I am, this old broad, not paying him any attention. And it was just this, I, I, I thought it was so cleverly written that those guys were so much fun. That was an absolute blast working on that. I mean, I enjoyed it because even your character, even though you weren't, and I'm, once again, air quotes, his girlfriend, it works in his lie that he portrayed throughout that, that um, episode because it made sense to every other character that he got so infatuated with you to the point where it's just sort of like, well, we, we understand now. We get it, you know? <laughs> 
Um, one thing I would like to ask, um, mainly because character actors, I said at the start of this interview, character actors, you guys are like the backbone of every show, mainly because, you know, stars is, it is what it is, but you guys are, I guess, comforting, that's the word I want to use, because when I see a person like you or a working character actor, like, oh, I know that person, they were in this thing, I trust that this is good, because... I've seen their work previously, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you have what you would call a defining role? No, which is why I think I'm not famous. I didn't. I never got that one role that shoots you into the stratosphere. I came close a couple times, and it didn't work out. So, you know, we all have different journeys, and I think I had a lot of lessons to learn about, quote-unquote, not success in order to appreciate the incredibly successful life I have, even though it's not the career I had imagined. And, you know, and so it goes. You know, show business is very impersonal. I've coached a lot of young actors starting out, and it's that reminder that you need to wear show business like a cloak, you know, not like a fitted sweater. Because it's, uh, you, you know, you when you become an actor, and you're, if people come up to you and say, what do you do? And you say, I'm an actor. And it's like, you know, people back out of the room slowly because when I go to audition for a part, I'm bringing all of me to the table. The fact that I'm a wife and a mother and an artist and a writer and I play bridge and I garden and I make bread and I do stained glass. And I've never met an actor yet who was creative only in one way. Every actor I've ever known, they also either do visual art, they dance, they sing, they play a musical instrument, they write. You know, when you're a creative person, you're a creative person. And if you just obsess about this acting career thing, you're not developing yourself as a human being. You need to play and travel and have hobbies. And don't stop your life because of show business. Show business needs to fit into your life, not your life into show business. And I think in, you know, I had a lot to learn about that. I think most people who go into show business do not come from happy, well-adjusted homes. And a lot of times people want to become a famous actor to fill in all those, you know, paint by number holes that are dry inside of, you know, like, oh, if I get fame and recognition in the world, you know, I will mean something, I will have substance, I will prove to myself finally that I'm lovable. Am I just talking about myself? Uh, but anyway. No, I that's good. I you are dropping gems, Lee. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to sit down and get on, just listen. That was... That's good, please. Yeah, and so I, I think I always say to young people starting out, just, you know, this is, you know, my, my husband pointed out to me once that when people asked me what I did, because I always look familiar to people, I always said I make my living as an actor. And I did that for two reasons. One, you're not going to then ask me, yeah, I know you're an actor, but what's your B job? And then the other reason is I do make my living as an actor. It's my career. It's what I do. It's not who I am. Am I an actor? Absolutely. But I also make my living as an actor. It's my profession. I'm also all those other things I just described. And they're just as vital and, and integral of my beingness. You know, and so not having that one defining role that, you know, catapults you into the stratosphere is, you know, when the barometer of success in Hollywood is fame, it's difficult to remind yourself, you know, you, you are successful, you have had a successful career. It isn't Meryl Streep or Denzel Washington, but there's only one Meryl and one Denzel, and that's the way it goes. And uh, my number one overall abiding feeling at this point in my life is gratitude. I'm just so grateful that I have a body of work that I, you know, got to make my living, that I've met the amazing people I've met on this journey, and uh, it's an adventure. That's awesome. You know, and for me, the big, big lesson is happiness is wanting what you have, not having what you want. That that that's awesome. There's nothing I can say that can follow that up. <laughs> I mean, that everything you just said, I'm just like, wow. I mean, like, the reason I, I can say that is because it's sort of like you figured it out what works for you the best way, and I just I I see it in your um when you say you bring all of your life experiences to the stage in whatever role you're playing, I can see where being multifaceted in a normal life, it 
you get, you get the golden opportunity to make a living by playing pretend, and you do, and it's awesome, and you don't take it for granted. But at the same time, you don't let that interfere with you, Lee, as the person. Sam, you have described it beautifully and perfectly. That's exactly right, Lee. I wish you, I, I know we went a little bit over um, our scheduled interview time, but you were dropping gems. I'm not cutting any of this out. This is beautiful because any aspiring actor um, or any any creative that's currently listening to me right now can take something from that. I wish you the best of luck on Emmys. Remember, outstanding actress in the short film or comedy or drama series. And lastly... I want you to put out your social media because I only believe I'll scratch the surface, Lee. And you are oh. welcome back anytime. Okay. Yes, I, I'm just, I'm, this has been my new journey in social media. I'm, I am Lee Garlington is both my Twitter and my Instagram. So not I am, but I am, like I'm. Got it. And, uh, yeah. So that's cool. And if anybody uh, wants to contact me, uh, I have a website, www.leegarlingtontheactress.com. Okay, and I will make because sure I... Lee Garlington was taken, of course. I couldn't really? even have my own name, so I had to come up with a website that sounds like, oh, somebody who has a website saying Lee Garlington, the actress, you know they're not a real actor. They're just saying that. Like, damn. No, you you are. You have the credit to prove it. I've, I've seen it. <laughs> um, but I will make sure I post that. Um as we post this on social media so people can come out and see you i'm pretty sure lee you are always welcome to this podcast it was such a joy to talk oh, to you thank you and um i wish you the best of luck and thank you so much for just being a part of the podcast no thank you i really appreciate it i'm so glad that we're all we all get all these wonderful ways to be creative and this is your creativity and you do it beautifully Oh, thank you so much. Now I'm blushing. Now, now, I, I, oh my God. I, if I don't play anything, I'm going to play that last part to my wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, see, it matters. <laughs> but thank you so much, Lee. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye.